Excellent. Now we have Creating a Poetry Book with Peter Chubb. Peter has contributed to many open source projects over the years, mostly on low-level system code. In recent years, Peter has been helping to grow the open source community around SEL4 and contributing to its ecosystem. This talk is far away from that work, however. Today, Peter will talk about using the LaTeX typesetting system to produce a publication-ready poetry book. Please welcome Peter. Hello, folks. I'd like to start by saying this is nothing whatsoever to do with my work, it's all on my own time, and that I do have a note from my mother to say that I'm allowed to quote some of her poetry. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the land of the uh, Wawanjiri Woi people uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and to mention that most of the poems that I'm going to be talking about were developed in Armadale in the Anaiwan Ganawayan people's country. And my mother is actually fairly involved with the keeping place and so forth to help maintain Aboriginal culture. But anyway, this story starts when you've got a whole heap of documents in some kind of order, uh, possibly bundled, and you want to boil that down into a book. So you have some collection of poems and some previous poetry books. You want a real printed book with all of the poems nicely typeset in some kind of order that makes sense and with all the other things that makes a book rather than just a collection of poems on a website. So let's start by having a look at what's in a book. The first thing you see when you pick up a book is its cover. This happens to be an 1865 edition of Banks's Endeavour Journal. As you can see, this particular one's in boards, uh, which are cloth covered and with a leather spine. But you could just have a paper spine or you could have leather, leather covers all over. You need to just know that fairly early on because it involves some of your later typesetting decisions. If you open the book, you see the end papers. Now, when you've got a book, a hardcover, you tend to glue across the spine sheets of um, gauze, um, like you use with bandages, and then use that to glue the covers on. If you just do that, you can see the bits of gauze and it looks really ugly. So what publishers do is put a piece of paper across the whole of the inside, and that's your end paper. Traditionally, they were a plain colour. Around the 1890s, marbled covers started becoming really popular. And then later on, in the early 1900s, some publishers started using printed end papers. Modern uh, editions tend to be just plain white, or they're printed with something that's relevant to the inside of the book. Uh, I can't show you any of those because they're still in copyright. After you've gone past the end papers, you come to the half title page. The only thing on this is the title. Back in the early days of publishing, before they had really good ways of cheaply putting the name on the spine of the book, they left that blank and you were expected to cut out the half title page and glue it onto the back yourself when you got home. Or if you made a box for the book, you glue it onto that. Nowadays, publishers quite often leave out the title, half title page, but there was a period between about 1810 and 1940 where the half title was left in, it just didn't, didn't show any useful purpose. You then come to the most important page in the book from the type designers, from the designer's point of view, and that's the title page. The only things that are essential on the title page are the name of the book and the author's name. Plus, if it's part of a series, you might have the name of the series and which number it is in the series. This particular version's got some other information as, as well. If you're going to sign a book as a dedication to somebody else, don't sign the title page unless you're the author. Because the title page is traditionally reserved for the author to sign a dedication for. The pages after the title page are the copyright pages. They're really important from the point of view of asserting your rights in the book and mentioning any other people who might have copyright material that's in your book. In this particular case, the copyright information as to who the publisher is, their address, and the date it was published is on the title page. And that was fairly common for early books before the Berne Convention was signed. Nowadays, it's normally on the back of the title page. You'll also often see in there a line of numbers starting at zero, in, starting at 10 in the middle and going out to one at the left and two at the right, like that. 
That's for different impressions from the same set of printing plates. And what happens there is that you make your printing run, and that wears out the plates a little bit. And when you've sold out of that, you do another printing run. But before you do the printing, next printing run, you carve off the one on that first page. So you know it's the second impression of the first edition, and so on. Um, pr printing plates wear out as they get used. So by the time you get to the tenth impression, it's normally pretty fuzzy. You then come to the foreword and the, or the prolegonomen or the uh, introduction, which is often written by somebody other than the author. They have their own copyright in that, which needs to be acknowledged somewhere else. Then you've got all the tables of contents, figures, and so forth. And then you finally get to the real book. All of the stuff before now has been numbered differently. It's been numbered with Roman numerals. Now you come to the bit that's named, numbered, numbered with Arabic numerals, and that goes to the end of the book, and it contains what the author wrote. Right at the end, and you'll see it here, is the publisher's colophon. That contains information about the printer and what he did to print the book. In this case, it just got um, some printer's name in Edinburgh. Um, but you can put whatever you want in there as the person who did the printing. We should probably mention book bindings too. There are about four common book binding techniques that are used. And you need to know this because it changes what, what, what you've got of your page to typeset onto. One really simple method is the ring binding or spiral binding, uh, the tech books like this. The main problem with that one, as you can see in the top left-hand corner, is that the, it tears away, the, the pages tear away. The advantage is it's relatively cheap, you can do it in an office binding machine, and the book will open out flat. Perfect binding, so-called, you just take up the stock paper, make some narrow cuts across the top and fill it up with glue. And then, if you're using a paper binding, you just put the paper binding directly over the top. If you're using a cloth binding, you put your cloth tapes across the top and let the glue set. The main problems with these is if you use an inferior quality glue, the stuff breaks and you get broken spines. If you use a good glue, then you can't open the book completely. So you can't open it flat. Uh, be that as it may, most books nowadays are perfect bound. You can get perfect binding both in hardbacks and softbacks. I believe, no, 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 I have actually met softbacks that are um, non-perfect bound. And the last way to make it is sew it in signatures. Now the early printers, um, what they do is they take a huge piece of paper and print up 32 pages on the print thing and then fold it and then sew that to all the other ones that were there. And then they would ship that as, as the book. And you'd have to cut the pages yourself when you got it. Later on, they did the same thing with the folding trick, but they would trim off the edges. Uh, and that's what most of the high quality books are today. You can also, instead of using linen thread, which is archival quality, use steel, otherwise known as staples. Metal stitched books, last really nicely for about 40, 50 years, and then the metal starts rusting, and you get rust stains all over your book. Um, so for archival quality books, you probably want to use linen thread rather than uh, metal stitched. Um, if you have a binding that is like the uh, spiral binding, or like a perfect binding, or a Japanese stab binding, which I didn't actually mention, then you lose some of your book on the left-hand side, on the inside edge of each page. So that green line there, everything to the left of that you can't really use because it's used up by the binding. And that changes the aspect ratio of your page when you go to lay it out. Likewise, if you're using a, a sewn-in signatures um, book, the inner pages stick out further than the outer pages. So you have to allow for trimming the page, and every page is going to have a slightly different aspect ratio. You may want to trim more off than you would just absolutely have to in order to change the aspect ratio of the page. So um, all the uh, A series papers, they're all uh, root two, square root of two ratio between the length and the height. If you wanted to move that more to the golden ratio, which is like one to 1.56 something, you'd need to chop it off a bit more. Either way, you need to know what that trim is that you want to do. Now, when I first did a poetry book back in 1996, end of 96, early 97, 
we were still back at LaTeX version 2, and it didn't have any really good ways of laying out pages that weren't American paper. The A4, A5 styles really sucked. And they didn't have any really good verse packages to lay out poetry. So I created my own styles from scratch. That was really, really tedious and really hard to maintain as new versions of LaTeX came up along. But today, in 2023, there's this class for layout called the memoir class which provides really good opportunity for page layout, and it understands a series paper. The other thing I needed was a good way of laying out verse. The big thing that the built-in verse class, verse style that happens in memoir class that doesn't do is wrap lines. If you can see in this line, there's one really long line. For poetry, what you do is you take the end words and wrap them and align them right, so you can tell it's still part of the same line because the line structure is part of the poem. It's not just something that's added on. So, the, main, the, the remaining thing is to build an index, so we've got an index of the poems. There's memoir classes built in stuff for generating the uh, input to an indexing program. There's a public domain, uh, sorry, open source make index program that you can run on that to generate the LaTeX to be styled for your index. So, we're set. So, what have I got? I've got three previous books in the series. I've got a collection of poems in Word or Microsoft Works format, plus a whole heap that are handwritten in writing that's got worse and worse as my mother's eyesight's been fading. So, what I want is, firstly, to convert that to plain text. ABI Word can understand the um, doc format that was exported from Works and Microsoft Word format, so we can generate plain text from it. So if I take a doc poem that looks like this, this is a really good poem, by the way, I might read it to you. It's called 77 Trombones. Here's how we planned it. Brass glinting in bright sunlight. Kids shouting, clapping, waving flags. The old is smiling, eyes moist with memories. Dogs straining at leashes, sniffing the air. Horses, camels, monkeys, clowns, tumblers, jugglers, fire eaters, men on stilts. Girls in gaudy costumes, tableau by the truckload. Balloons lofting into the blue, blue yonder. Lost in the razzle-dazzle of summer sun. But it rained and nobody came. Anyway, that's an example of my mum's poem. But that's the, the doc format. After you've converted it, you get something that looks like this. And you'll notice that the spacing is a bit weird. Um, the line break there is that where it goes moist with memories is just because I had to fit it on the slide. It's not real. So we had to mark them as poems so I could actually style them and uh, add stanza separators and take all those tabs that Mama put in to separate out ideas and replace them with a cue quad. I wrote an orc script to do that. It's too big for the slides. You can get it from the Git repository. And then you end up with something that looks like this. And all I've got to do now is write the poem and stanza classes, uh, environments. So we're almost there. I'll give you a slight tech refresher. It's all about boxes. And a box has a height and a depth and a baseline. When, when text... Um, is in horizontal mode, it lines up all the boxes on the baseline. When it's on vertical mode, it goes down the page, lining things up on the um, left-hand edge. A character goes down below the baseline and up above it, and all characters are boxes. So if you type a line of type, what text sees is just these boxes, and it puts them all together. And it keeps on putting them all together until it gets to a point where it can't put any more in the, horizontal, um, in, in the horizontal space it's got. If you're in the middle of a word then, it says, ah, I, it's really bad to break here. I'll stretch all of the inter, interword spaces until I've got somewhere I can break. Because you've got glue in the between spaces. If you're going downwards, it does the same thing. It goes down until it can't fit any more on. It then tries to stretch the inner the, the interline inter space until everything fits. The interline spaces, or inter-character spaces, have this idea of a rubber length. You've got the base length, in this case, space of nine, 
and then it can stretch up to three more units or shrink up to one unit. And you can put infinite spaces in there too if you want to. So this thing, its natural width is 32 units, but it can actually squish into a 29 unit thing or up to a 41 unit thing. So let's look at the memoir class. It's got oodles of flexibility and a huge manual, but what I find is I need a bit of help to work out what it's doing. So what I do is I use the show frame package as well. What the show frame package does, in this case, it puts a red line around all the major elements on a page so I can see how what I'm laying out fits onto the page. The other thing I need to do is because of that glue, I can't always tell where particular elements end and where the next one begins because they can overlap. So I've created this tight frame thingy and I'll show what that means in a little while. In fact, the next slide. You can always use Fbox to put a box around something. But if you just do that, like here, you can see that the frame is bigger than the box that, that, that it's surrounding. And the distance between the, the, the line and the content is frame set, Fbox set. And the width of the line is um, Fbox rule. If I go back to that one, you'll see I set Fbox rule to one point and set Fbox set to minus the Fbox rule width. And that should give me a box that goes exactly around the content. And you can use that as you go along to show how you're going with your page layout. So what's the basics? I want to run on A5 paper, so I say stock AV. There's also stock V for far, stock A, uh, IV, and there's all the B sizes, and there's American sizes, and there's imperial sizes as well. But you say what the stock size of the paper is that you're going to print on. We're going to trim six millimeters off the outer edge and nothing off the top. So I'll set trims to six millimeters. Uh, and that's, you, you can see where that line is. We're then going to set the upper and lower margins. Oh no, first, for some reason, um, the memoir class doesn't actually set the paper width and paper height options. So I'm going to set those myself uh, because I'm going to need them later when I lay out the cover sheet. We're then going to set up the upper and lower margins. These, they set up our upper and lower and set right and left margins, which take either the two margins or one of the margins in a ratio, and the other argument you put an asterisk in. In this case, I'm going to want 25 millimeters at the top, 175 millimeters for text, and the bottom part is going to be for the footer. And I'm only going to use the footer when it's in draft mode, so it'll end up, all of that footer space will be space at the bottom for um, aesthetic reasons. We're going to set the head set, which is the distance between the header and the text, to 19 millimeters. I want to have plenty of room there to put the title of each poem in that space. And then we'll call check and fix the layout, which checks that all of the, all of the dimensions you've specified can actually fit onto an A5 sheet. And it will complain bitterly if you can't. Now, let's have a look at some poems. There are some poems that are just flush left. This is a nice one. Wet white stilts, wet footfalls, delicately walking through the shallows towards the house. Black cat in the shadow. Should I shout? But the white birds see the black shadow and launch into the sky, leaving the cat to lick her paws. So that one's just on the left. But you can also have poems that are just totally centered, like this dog thought. She thinks I'm walking to heel. I know I'm rounding her up. <laughs> Or you can have really, really wide ones. I'm not going to read this one too. It's not in my book, and it goes a bit longer, and you've only got one verse. Or you can have things that are totally arbitrary, and some, some, some things are indented and some stanzas are out, or individual stanzas have lines that are indented or out. So what I decided to do was create stanza styles for all the common cases, and then deal with the few that were totally arbitrary in a totally arbitrary way. So what I want is a long poem with many standards. I want to put the title at the top. Some titles have a tagline, which might be a quotation from something else. It might be a dedication. And then you put the stanza there, have an interstanza gap, then the next stanza, interstanza gap. And I want the interstanza gaps to be where you have any page breaks. So you don't break in the middle of a stanza unless you really, really have to. So you've got the long poems. And then after we've laid out all the long poems, we're going to put in what mum calls micro poems which are less than a stanza, you know, four lines like that dog thought one. 
And then you've got other ones too, which we can deal with later. So we're going to put the title at the top in headset just under the header. Each poem starts a new page, and we're going to encourage page breaks between panzas and try and lay things out so that two-page poems start on a verso page. And then after we've put all the poems in, we'll put the microphones in to put in the gaps. So the title poems. We want the title in all caps. We want it just below the rule. So I'm going to create a new length called title drop. And I'm going to start it just being minus the head separation. So minus that 19 millimeters. And I'll create the new environment poem. I'll do a clear page to move us to the top. And then I'm going to skip upwards by that title drop and put the title in. As you can see, there's this extra space. Hang on, I've just done something wrong. Uh, I've lost my thing. Here. And that's because when we start typesetting, we've actually one baseline skip down there. So we need to add another baseline skip in there. What's more, if we start putting the poetry in, it comes straight under the pipe, uh, under the title. So if we put the ba minus baseline skip in there as well, you move up to the title into the right place, but we've still got the poetry in the wrong place. So we need to put that poetry into a box. So we put it into a, into a vertical box that's the headset big, and then we get what we want. Oh, isn't that nice? There's only a couple of minor things to do. We need to, to do the stanza style. Now, GM verse um, assumes that each stanza is in its own verse environment. I didn't want to do that. I want to have the whole thing in one verse environment so we can get consistent typesetting for where the optical center of the line is across the entire poem, and then have a separate stanza style that puts things in the right places. So I'm going to new, it, new environment a stanza, which has the verse and the end verse. And we're going to skip 10 points. And then we're going to put this fill break instruction in. What fill break does is it puts an infinite fill in and then says, see if you can break the line here. I'm going to give you a hint. This is a good place. And then puts a negative infinite fill in to go back to where you were. The result is that if there's more stuff that can fit in there without really wrecking text page breaking algorithms, it'll go in there. But otherwise, you'll get a break after the, a page break after the uh, stanza. And that encourages page breaks between stanzas, which is exactly what we wanted. But you know how on this, this, this poem that it's in, indented a bit? If I just use the verse environment, it'll try and align it further to the left, and it doesn't look so good. So I'm going to allow each poem to give a suggested indent. So we're going to make it a, th a three argument instead of a two argument environment. I'll come to the second argument in a little bit. And we just set the verse left skip with that third argument. Uh, and we have alternate stanza. An alternate stanza is indented more. We're going to give it uh, another argument. Instead of being zero, we've now got one argument. By default, that argument is 1.3 times the verse left skip. But you can override it for a particular poem. You can even make it negative to outdent the stanza if you want to. And we're also going to have centered stanzas and wide stanzas. The wide stanzas takes an argument which is the longest line in the stanza. In fact, what I normally do is give it the longest line in the entire poem so that each wide stanza is aligned on the longest line of the, la la of the, la of the longest line of the poem. And that works well. We also need to style the micropoems. Micropoems are the same as the poem, except that they don't start at the top of a page. And you don't want to have the title so far above it. But it's pretty trivial to, to do that. So I'm not going to give you the um, full things. And the final thing we need to do is there's no, a poetry book is no good unless you can find the poems in it, so it needs an index. Memoir class has got functions to save stuff into the index. All you need to do is add the slash index command into the poem. So we'll do that. The, the, title, the, the, the poem environment has the title of the poem in, in its argument, so we'll just pass it in. And then at the end, we type print index to print the index. But some poems, you need something different in the index from what the title is. So we're going to add an extra opt opt optional argument at the beginning. Uh, and so it looks like this. So the begin poem, uh, the Ides of March, uh, but we want Ides of March, the, in the thing. That's pretty straightforward. So this time, we're going to make it three argument for the, um, from the poem environment. 
with an optional first one which is normally empty. We'll define index item to be that first argument. If it's empty, then we'll use the second argument, which is the title of the poem. If it's full, we'll use it for the index. And then we'll use hash two in the, uh, in the actual typesetting of the title. So that's that done. But when we come to print the index, if I just use print index, I get something that looks like this, which looks nothing like the other pages of the book. I can change the pales page style to ruled, like all the other ones, and get the, the line and the page number, but it still doesn't look right. And then I can you know, do all this stuff to extra things to style a pattern. I got fed up and just wrote my own um, index style. And at that point, I get exactly what I want. You'll notice that this little bit inside the index thing is exactly what we saw in the poem thing, because it's essentially the same. We want to move that index word right up the top and have a skip before the, um, before the, 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 the content. So the cover and the front matter, this is what took me the most time, trying to reproduce this. Um, Dad did it in some kind of Word, Windows drawing package, and I haven't got access to that. So what I did was I measured all those previous covers using a ruler. Um, I want the title page is the same as the cover. The back page is almost the same, but it's got different content. So if I can do something which will create that rule and give me something in the middle that I can put the, the uh, content in, then I've got the cover, I've got the title page, which is the same as the cover, and I've got the back page all sorted. So that's what I'm going to do. I measured it, and the first thing to do is create a box that goes to the width of the paper, that paper width uh, uh, thing I saved right at the beginning, and we're going to put it in a V-box to zero point. That's important because it means it doesn't take up any vertical space, which means it can start at the top. Uh, as opposed to nine millimeters down. We'll start by skipping nine millimeters minus the upper margin. Now the upper margin is where the text box starts. So if we go up, we've run at the top, then down nine millimeters, we're nine millimeters from the top. So that's what we want. We're gonna give this cover page an argument to say whether it's on the front or the back. Because on the front, we need to adjust the left margin, which is the spine margin. On the back, we need to adjust that margin, which is a different one. So if we look at this bit, we um, take 10 millimeters and subtract the spine margin to get 10 millimeters from the left on the, um, on the front page. And on the other page, we just go four millimeters in there. And that gives us that. And then we put the frame box in, there it is. And then we create a mini page, and a mini page LaTeX environment that you put any typesetting you want in it. We give that the size 122 millimeters across, which is from there to there, and 184 millimeters down, which is from there to there, and we put the second argument inside, which has got all the content for the picture and the title and everything else. And then we've done it. But some individual poems need a bit of extra work. This is a really good poem, so I'm gonna read it to you when I find it. Here we go. Um, and you can see in this one, you've got all these extra Q quads all over the place. Um, when you typeset it, it looks like that. And you can see it's all over the place. Here, here's how it goes. It's called In Plain Language. He asked me for a date. The hide. No way, I thought. I have to wash my hair, I said. Another time, he asked. The simpleton. Beneath my breath, I muttered. In your dreams. The nerd. No music in his soul. I cannot come, I said. My granny's sick. That should be plain enough for anyone, however dumb. Today, he called around with flowers. Nothing fancy. Daffodils and gilly flowers. Not for me. For granny. And she raved. She reads the sense of flowers as I the sense of words, but wouldn't tell. Just grinned. A cream-filled Cheshire cat. And now he's got his date with granny at the club. They won't be back till one or two. And I stay home and wash my hair. It isn't fair. It makes you sick. Yeah. When you come to the page just after the title page, the copyright page, it's one of the most important pages of the book because this is where you assert the rights of everybody involved in the book. The problem is there's at least four different copyrights in a poetry book, at least. The first one is the individual poem's text, the content that I just read out to you, for example. That belongs to the author, the poet, 
for up to, se to 70 years after that poet's death. The next is the typesetting. That's all the work I've been putting it in. That's going to last for 25 years from the date of publication. So if you get an out of, the, out of copyright, a, a, a book of out of copyright poems that was published recently, you still can't just photocopy it. The individual poems are out of copyright, so you can retypeset them from somewhere else, but you can't photocopy it. The collection as a whole is copyright. So if you get a collection of out of copyright poems, that's 25 years old more, the whole collection is probably still copyright to the editor if he's still alive or she's still alive, and so you cannot reproduce the entire book in the same order. And finally, the fonts and the pictures are used, uh, are copyright. I use Helvetica as the font to typesetting everything because there's a license for that with every postscript printer that's ever been produced. So when I give it to the copy shop to print, they've got a license to use Helvetica to print the thing. I could have used an open source uh, font, but then I would have had to embed the font, and it's unlikely that the um, copy shop would actually print it correctly. Uh, it's much better to use a, a standard font that's already available. And pictures, of course, have their own copyright for 70 years for, from the date of the author's, or of the painter's or artist's death. In Australia, copyright is automatic. It doesn't need a notice. But from the point of view of people who are trying to work out whether a work is copyright or not, what date it was copyrighted, and where to ask for information about using the thing, having the copyright in the book is really, really important. Laws change from time to time. If you're using other people's work, you need to get permission, and you need to assert your own copyright. So let's look at this one. First, I've got this extra stuff at the notes at the top. That shows where all the other poems were published before. Mum did not assign copyright to all these people for anything other than the particular work they were in. So she retained copyright, but it's still nice to acknowledge that they've been published somewhere else. Then you've got the additional work. In this case, the artwork and the photo on the back. And finally, you've got the copyright notice for the author and an address where that author can be contacted. If you're going to have a real book, it's got to have an ISBN. Um, you buy them from myidentifiers.com.au. It's cheaper to buy 10 at the time. You can buy the book, to the uh, ISBN now, and then use it in 10 years' time if you want to. So you can buy a batch, and as you publish them, fill in the details. They serve to represent a particular edition of a particular book. So if you're going to publish both in electronic and paper form, you need two ISBNs. Um, the nice thing about those is they totally identify a book, and they form the key that everybody in the world can use for your book. The other thing is that the Copyright Act in Australia says you've got to deposit a copy of your book with the National Library of Australia. And in New South Wales, you need to send a copy to the State Library. There are two other deposit libraries, University of Sydney Library and the, National, and, the, and the State Parliamentary Library, for those don't want all books, but you need to offer it to them. And if they say, yes, we want this, you've got to send off a copy. Now that brings me to the end of my talk. I do want to say that all poetry is copyright to Val Chubb, that's my mum, and was used but with her permission. But that's the end of my talk. Have you got any questions? Thank you, Peter. Do we have any questions for Peter? If you don't have any questions, I can inflict another poem on you. <laughs> Would you like that? I, I okay. have a before you, can I ask a question before Yeah, you sure. Can, yeah. <laughs> so you, you uh, I take it that this is a, a, a series and you've added a volume to this series. Is that um, right? Like you... These are the series, yeah. right? When my dad died, mum posted uh, a separate one, which is sort of similar but different that is not in the series. And this one's uh, mostly fairly maudlin poems about my dad. Right. Uh, and she doesn't sell this one, she just gives it away. So I, I, you mentioned that your dad used uh, basically like a WYSIWYG editor. Yeah, to he used Frame Maker. Right, and, but you've, you've gone with a, a LaTeX. With LaTeX, as yeah. A, and I was just interested in why you decided to go down that route. Instead. Because I know LaTeX, right. I can use it. <laughs> I've, I've used LaTeX since Donald Knuth brought out his tech book and I was frustrated with Tiroff. <laughs> right, do you, do you, have you got any thoughts on the, on the benefits of doing it one way or the other or is it just that you knew? Um, the, the big thing about using LaTeX is you can set up the style 
and it works for everything. And the next time I've got a book to do, which mum's got another one on the thing, I don't need to change anything, it just works. Whereas with the WYSIWYG thing, you style a poem and it doesn't take on to the next poem and the next poem and the next poem, you've got to do each, all of them individually. And even if you set up a template, the template never quite corresponds in the right places. Whereas with the LaTeX, it's just a programming language and you can program it to do whatever you need to. Uh, well, if there's no more questions, uh, Peter, feel free to... You're going to get another poem. Yep. In fact, another two. This one's called The Elephant in the Room, and it's the last poem in the book. Because what mum did was she told me which poem needed to go first, which one had to go at the page break in the middle when you open it up flat, and which one had to go at the end. And I organised the vest to fit in between those. So this is the last poem, and because it had a bit of space on the page, I put an extra one in the end. Anyway, this is the poem. The Elephant in the Room. Three days before the world ended... Scientists debated whether greenhouse gas was a new phenomenon or had it possibly killed off the dinosaurs. Politicians legislated against global warming, then returned to the interrupted blame game, arguing about who, what, when and where, but not encompassing the question of why, and totally avoiding the problem of what to do next. TV philosophers and talkback hosts discussed interesting topics such as how many multinationals could fit onto an oil slick, and would humans ultimately develop gills in order to survive once ocean levels became critical? Two days before the world ended, members of a cult in middle America followed their charismatic leader into the sea on a quest to find Atlantis. They were never seen again, but popular opinion had it that they were swallowed by a whale whose usual food source had unaccountably vanished. On the world's penultimate day, Media outlets ran polls on whether media activity had increased significantly, and statisticians conducted an online survey of sightings worldwide of the Loch Ness Monster. Insurance salesmen lowered the premium on sudden death and or unexpected loss of life, and took on new employees to cope with the extra business. FairBetAustralia.com gave odds of seven to one against the world's demise. On the last day, And the final poem I'm going to read to you, I promise, it's just called Exit. It's the last poem in the book. And I'll read you the poem and then I'll give you the context. In ones and twos and threes and fours, they all approach the sliding doors. Some move slowly, some quite fast. But each must go through the doors at last. Now, the context of that one, I mean, in, in the context of the book, it sounds like it's the end of the world and everyone's going to die, right? But in the context of, the, of my mum's thinking, she was sitting in a, in a shopping centre waiting for my sister and there were these sliding doors going bzzz, bzzz, and she was just watching people going out. That's all there was. <laughs> so, so there you go. Very good. Thanks again, Peter.